first part of chapter two of the first volume of the life of reason this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by frederick carlson the life of reason by george santayana chapter two first steps and first fluctuations side note dreams before thoughts consciousness is a born hermit though subject by divine dispensation to spells of fervour and apathy like a singing bird it is at first quite unconcerned about its own conditions or maintenance to acquire a notion of such matters or an interest in them it would have to lose its hearty simplicity and begin to reflect it would have to forget the present with its instant joys in order laboriously to conceive the absent and the hypothetical the body may be said to make for self-preservation since it has an organic equilibrium which when not too rudely disturbed restores itself by growth in cooperative action but no such principle appears in the soul foolish in the beginning and generous in the end consciousness thinks of nothing so little as of its own interests it is lost in its objects nor would it ever acquire even an indirect concern in its future did not love of things external attach it to their fortunes attachment to ideal terms is indeed what gives consciousness its continuity its parts have no relevance or relation to one another save what they acquire by depending on the same body or representing the same objects even when consciousness grows sophisticated and thinks it cares for itself it really cares only for its ideals the world it pictures seems to it beautiful and it may incidentally prize itself also when it has come to regard itself as a part of that world in italy however it is free even from that honest selfishness it looks straight out it is interested in the movements it observes it swells with the represented world suffers with its commotion and subsides no less willingly in its interludes of calm natural history and psychology arrive at consciousness from the outside and consequently give it an artificial articulation and rationality which are wholly alien to its essence these sciences infer feeling from habit or expression so that only the expressible and practical aspects of feeling figure in their calculation but these aspects are really peripheral the core is an irresponsible ungoverned irrevocable dream psychologists have discussed perception ad nauseum and become horribly entangled in a combined idealism and physiology for they must perforce approach the subject from the side of matter since all science and all evidence is external nor could they ever reach consciousness at all if they did not observe its occasions and then interpret those occasions dramatically at the same time the inferred mind they subject to examination will yield nothing but ideas and it is marvel how such a dream can regard those natural objects from which the psychologist has inferred it perception is in fact no primary phase of consciousness it is an ulterior practical function acquired by a dream which has become symbolic of its conditions and therefore relevant to its own destiny such relevance and symbolism are indirect and slowly acquired their status cannot be understood unless we regard them as forms of imagination happily grown significant in imagination not in perception lies the substance of experience while knowledge and reason are but its chastened and ultimate form side note the mind vegetates uncontrolled save by physical forces every actual animal is somewhat dull and somewhat mad he will at times miss his signals and stare vacantly when he might well act 
while at other times he will run off into convulsions and raise a dust in his own brain to no purpose. These imperfections are so human that we should hardly recognize ourselves if we could shake them off altogether. Not to retain any dullness would mean to possess untiring attention and universal interests, thus realizing the boast about deeming nothing human alien to us while to be absolutely without folly would involve perfect self-knowledge and self-control. The intelligent man known to history nourishes within a dullard and holds a lunatic in leash. He is encased in a protective shell of ignorance and insensibility which keeps him from being exhausted and confused by this too complicated world, but that integument blinds him at the same time to many of his nearest and highest interests. He is amused by the antics of the brute dreaming within his breast. He gloats on his passionate reveries, an amusement which sometimes costs him very dear. Thus the best human intelligence is still decidedly barbarous. It fights in heavy armor and keeps a fool at court. Side note. Internal order supervenes. If consciousness could ever have the function of guiding conduct better than instinct can, in the beginning it would be most incompetent for that office. Only the routine and equilibrium which healthy instinct involves keep thought and will at all within the limits of sanity. The predetermined interests we have as animals fortunately focus our attention on practical things, pulling it back, like a ball with an elastic cord, within the radius of pertinent matters. Instinct alone compels us to neglect and seldom to recall the irrelevant infinity of ideas. Philosophers have sometimes said that all ideas come from experience. They never could have been poets and must have forgotten that they were ever children. The great difficulty in education is to get experience out of ideas. Shame, conscience and reason continually disallow and ignore what consciousness presents. And what are they but habit and latent instinct asserting themselves and forcing us to disregard our midsummer madness? Idiocy and lunacy are merely reversions to a condition in which present consciousness is in the ascendant and has escaped the control of unconscious forces. We speak of people being out of their senses when they have in fact fallen back into them, or of those who have lost their mind when they have lost merely that habitual control of a consciousness which prevented it from flaring into all sorts of obsessions and agonies. Their bodies having become deranged, their minds, far from correcting that derangement, instantly share and betray it. A dream is always simmering below the conventional surface of speech and reflection. Even in the highest reaches and serenest meditations of science, it sometimes breaks through. Even there, we are seldom constant enough to conceive a truly natural world. Somewhere, passionate, fanciful or magic elements will slip into the scheme and baffle rational ambition. A body seriously out of equilibrium, either with itself or with its environment, perishes outright. Not so a mind. Madness and suffering can set themselves no limit. They lapse only when the corporeal frame that sustains them yields to circumstances and changes its habit. If they are unstable at all, it is because they ordinarily correspond to strains and conjunctions which are vigorous body overcomes or which dissolves the body altogether a pain not incidental to the play of practical instincts may easily be recurrent and it might be perpetual if even the worst habits were not intermittent and the most useless agitations exhausting some respite will therefore ensue upon pain but no magic cure Madness, in like manner, if pronounced, 
is precarious but when speculative enough to be harmless or not strong enough to be debilitating it too may last for ever an imaginative life may therefore exist parasitically in a man hardly touching his action or environment there is no possibility of exercising these apparitions by their own power a nightmare does not dispel itself it endures until the organic strain which caused it is relaxed either by natural exhaustion or by some external influence therefore human ideas are still for the most part sensuous and trivial shifting with the chance currents of the brain and representing nothing so to speak but personal temperature personal temperature moreover is sometimes tropical there are brains like a south american jungle as there are others like an arabian desert strewn with nothing but bones while a passionate sultriness prevails in the mind there is no end to its luxuriance languages intricately articulate flaming mythologies metaphysical perspectives lost in affinity arise in remarkable profusion in time however there comes a change of climate and the whole forest disappears it is easy from the standpoint of acquired practical competence to deride a merely imaginative life derision however is not interpretation and the better method of overcoming erratic ideas is to trace them out dialectically and see if they will not recognize their own fatuity the most irresponsible vision has certain principles of order and valuation by which it estimates itself and in these principles the life of reason is already broached however halting may be its development we should lead ourselves out of our dream as the israelites were led out of egypt by the promise and eloquence of that dream itself otherwise we might kill the goose that lays the golden egg and by prescribing imagination abolish science side note intrinsic pleasure in existence side note pleasure a good visionary experience has a first value in its possible pleasantness why any form of feeling should be delightful is not to be explained transcendentally a physiological law may after the fact render every instance predictable but no logical affinity between the formal quality of an experience and the impulse to welcome it will thereby be disclosed we find however that pleasure suffuses certain states of mind and pain others which is another way of saying that for no reason we love the first and detest the second the polemic which certain moralists have waged against pleasure and in favour of pain is intelligible when we remember that their chief interest is edification and that ability to resist pleasure and pain alike is a valuable virtue in a world where action and renunciation are the twin keys to happiness but to deny that pleasure is a good and pain an evil is a grotesque affectation it amounts to giving good and evil artificial definitions and thereby reducing ethics to arbitrary verbiage not only is good that adherence of the will to experience of which pleasure is the basic example and evil the corresponding rejection which is the very essence of pain but when we pass from good and evil in sense to their highest embodiments pleasure remains eligible and pain something which it is a duty to prevent a man who without necessity deprived any person of a pleasure or imposed on him a pain would be a contemptible knave and the person so injured would be the first to declare it nor could the highest celestial tribunal if it was just reverse that sentence for it suffices that one being however weak loves or abhors anything no matter how slightly for that thing to acquire a proportionate value which no chorus of contradiction ringing through all the spheres can ever wholly abolish 
an experience good or bad in itself remains so forever and its inclusion in a more general order of things can only change that totality proportionately to the ingredient absorbed which will infect the mass so far as it goes with its own color the more pleasure a universe can yield other things being equal the more beneficent and generous is its general nature the more pains its constitution involves the darker and more malign is its total temper to deny this would seem impossible yet it is done daily for there is nothing people will not maintain when they are slaves to superstition and candour and a sense of justice are in such a case the first things lost End of chapter two part one